So welcome to part two of chapter two. And today what we're gonna talk about are the concepts of efficiency and constrained maximums, okay? Now within the structure of private property rights, a person can use resources under his or her control to produce other assets. An efficiently produced amount of some good is referred to as a constrained maximum of that good. More of a specified good would require the reduced production of some other good or goods. And this trade-off is represented by uh, the production possibilities frontier. Now I should note uh, that the authors of this book use the phrase production possibilities boundary instead of frontier. I like frontier because it's the final frontier. Frontier just sounds like a cooler word. Uh, so I'm gonna be using production possibilities frontier instead of production possibilities boundary, okay? And what this um, looks like <clears throat> is a, a quick and easy and, and very common graph to use. We can have two goods, let's call them uh, coconuts and let's say fish, okay? And what we have is a production possibilities frontier uh, that looks kind of like this. So if we were, let's say, at this point here, where we produced you know, some combination of fish and some combination of coconuts. In fact, let's just give some numbers to it uh, just to make it easier for us. Let's say we caught uh, 100 fish and we harvested, let's say, 50 coconuts. If I wanted to have more coconuts, well, that would mean that I would have to dedicate more time toward harvesting coconuts, which means I would have less time available to catch fish. So if I wanted to get to, let's say, 75 coconuts, well, that means that I would only be able to catch maybe 80 fish. In other words, what this is referring to is this concept that we call opportunity cost. Okay, the opportunity cost of any action is the foregone uh, alternative that you could have pursued. So in this case, the opportunity cost of these 25 fish would be the 20 coconuts. I'm sorry, I have that backwards. The 25 coconuts and the 20 fish. Okay? <clears throat> in other words, if I'm currently at 100 fish and 50 coconuts, I can reduce my fish by 20 to increase my coconuts by 25. Okay, now <clears throat> we should get into a di discussion between efficiency and maximization. Okay, in this framework, we could maximize the amount of coconuts that we produce. That would be really easy, right? We'd just spend all of our time harvesting coconuts, and let's say we get something like 150 coconuts. Okay, in this context or in this example, if we maximize the amount of coconuts that we had, well, we would do that by producing or catching zero fish, right? So we could have 150 coconuts, but that means zero uh, fish, okay? Now, that may be all well and good in the context of coconuts and fish, depending on your proclivities, but we can instead think about different goods. So what if we were thinking about perhaps medical care? I think that uh, given that this is January of 2021, we can probably all agree that medical care is an economic good. It's something that we would want to see more of than less of, right? Okay, so if we wanted to maximize medical care, one way we could do this is by making it so that everyone in the United States uh, went to medical school, right? We just send everyone to medical school, okay? And we send them there long enough that, uh, you know, for however much however many years it takes for them to pass all of their exams, right? We just send them all there. And then everybody in the world, or in the US at least, would be a doctor, right? And that would maximize our uh, ability to provide medical care. So now that everyone is able to provide medical care, would this be a good thing, okay? So on the one hand, we can think of this just like we did with uh, fish and coconuts. We can think of perhaps like housing, or food <clears throat> as being on this axis here and medical care on this axis here. 
we should still have a uh, concave production possibilities frontier. And so if we were here, right, where we're maximizing the amount of medical care, well, that means we have zero housing and zero food, right? <clears throat> now, uh, this means that uh, while we would all have affordable access to medical care, because after all, we could provide our own medical care to ourselves, we would have nowhere to live and nothing to eat. Now, that doesn't really sound like such a great uh, society. So instead of wanting just medical care, we probably also want to have housing, food, and perhaps even some, uh, let's just call it entertainment. Okay, But to get more of these things means we have to give up some medical care. So if we wanted to get up to like here, well, we would have less medical care. <clears throat> and we'll just call this Y, we would have less medical care, but more of all these other things. So what we want to do is we want to be able to evaluate this trade-off here, where we go from having 100% of us providing medical care and 0% of us providing food and other things, to having somewhere less than 100% of us providing medical care, but having much more access to housing, food, and the other things. Okay. This is uh, a common example of this, is to point to uh, the differences between the United States and the former Soviet Union. Okay, so there, uh, what we had was uh, the beginnings of the space race. Okay, so we had a situation where we could say on the one axis we have food, and on the other we have like going to space. Okay we still face a production possibilities frontier. The more resources we dedicate toward getting a man into space, the less resources we have dedicated toward producing food. In the United States, we seemed, at least initially, to be, let's say here, I'm just making this up, okay? Uh, but the former Soviet Union seemed to be operating uh, closer to here, right? Where most of their GDP or most of their resources had gone toward getting into space. Now, as a result, the Soviet Union won the space race. They were the first to put a man into space and bring him back. Okay? But at the same time, they were producing far less food. Right? That increased space production, if you will, came at the cost of reduced food production. And so while they did successfully get someone into space before the United States did, they weren't really able to feed their people as well. Okay? And all of this is because those resources that went toward producing food have an opportunity cost. Namely, <clears throat> the opportunity cost of going to space is, in some sense, feeding your people. Okay? <clears throat> the production possibilities frontier forces us to think about these trade-offs. Given in the medical care case, given how much medical care and housing we have, how much housing would we be willing to give up to have more medical care, and is that trade-off worth it? <clears throat> now, while this all may seem pretty straightforward, like all things in economics, there are differences and context and subjective values, okay? <clears throat> For example, you might look at the world and say that there's too much land devoted to golf courses and not enough land devoted to housing. Okay, well, we can draw that, okay? So we'd have, you know, golf here and housing uh, here, okay? And again, we have a familiar production possibilities frontier. So let's say we both agree that this is where we are, okay? So uh, I'll call it 50 and, you know, 50 just for sake of numbers, okay? And you might say, that's too much golf. We need more housing. So in your opinion, it would be more efficient to be maybe uh, here, right? <clears throat> but in my opinion, I might say, no, we have far too much housing and not enough golf courses. And so I would say that we need to move uh, this. Oh, this marker is not working. Okay, good to know. <clears throat> we might need to move uh, to here. How do we decide who is right? How do we decide which one of us uh, gets to actually 
uh, make that decision about whether we move this way or this way. That's a really important question, okay? <clears throat> and somehow we have to figure out a way to answer that question. We also have uh, differences in the types of efficient, okay? So uh, as an example, I drive a uh, Volkswagen uh, Jetta, okay? It gets about 22 miles uh, per gallon of gas, okay? Uh, one of my colleagues here drives a Tesla, uh, which in terms of miles per gallon, it actually gets an infinite number of miles uh, per gallon of gas, right? Because if you think about it, you could put a gallon of gas in a Tesla and you could drive it and it wouldn't deplete the gallon at all, right? So the Tesla gets an infinite amount of miles, of miles per gallon of gas. My Volkswagen Jetta only gets 22 miles per gallon. So on the dimension of which car is more efficient in terms of inputs versus outputs, it's clear the Tesla wins, right? This would be called uh, technical efficiency. Technical efficiency, okay? So that's a direct comparison of inputs to outputs. On the other hand, I also know uh, that my car cost me about uh, $20,000 and my colleague's car cost him about $45,000. So on the dimension of dollars per car, right, because my car drives just as well as, as my colleagues, on that dimension, well, my car wins, right? <clears throat> if we compare dollars to uh, being able to drive, you should buy a Jetta, right? So then I'm behaving efficiently, okay? Alternatively, we could look at the metric of how much does it cost to drive each car 100,000 miles? Uh, and we could include the cost of gas or electricity, repairs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know the answer to that question, uh, and I might have to look into it because who knows? Maybe my next car will be a Tesla. So in the end, uh, what economics really is, and the authors are, are very good to point this out, what economics really is, is it's actually kind of a, a biology in the sense that it is a science of life. Now, it's not a sense, it's not a, a biology in the sense that we look at cells and all that kind of stuff, but we are concerned with how people live, right? <clears throat> the basic unit of analysis is the individual, right? Which is why economists typically don't talk about what groups of people are doing. Instead, we talk about what individual people do, right? The incentives that they face. It is a positive science in that we are ultimately concerned with if-then statements. It is not a normative science in the sense that we are concerned with what should be or what ought to be, right? Even though, as some people will say, economics is a positive science that may have some normative implications, right? We're not concerned so much with proving what things are efficient and what thing, what tax codes might be efficient or what the optimal immigration rate would be. We're more concerned with, hey, if you change the rules, then what's going to happen? And in that sense, an economist who proffers specific advice and says, you know, we should abolish policy number X or letter X or whatever, right? Well, they're importing their own subjective and normative beliefs about them. Econ economics by itself cannot actually answer the question of what should we do. All it can do is answer if-then questions.